Praise God for his good work. Pastor Josh. Good morning, church. Uh, it's good to be back with you guys. I uh, really appreciate you guys giving me the time to be with my new family. Uh, I don't know, he like poops, sleeps, and eats. So it's like, that's pretty common. I think I'm getting pretty good at changing diapers. Uh, you could call me a pro now. Uh, but I am, uh, yeah, really enjoying dad life. When people ask me how it's going, like this whole parenting thing, which is a great question to ask, you know, uh, but my first answer is it's fun and tiring, right? But firstly, it's fun because, uh, I don't know, I just can't stop staring at the kids, so it's, it's a really big joy. Uh, I also want to say thank you to Pastor Eric for preaching last week. Uh, he started off our new series here in Hebrews. Uh, if you didn't hear his sermon, it'll be on YouTube in the next a uh, couple days, but uh, the main idea was, if you remember, if you didn't get to hear it, uh, let Christ run your life because he is Lord of life. Right? It's this idea that because Jesus is Lord, not just in name, but really of the entirety of life, all of our lives, we should allow him to be the one that leads and steers our lives. I know in this church there are some really good cooks, uh, and that's because we have all those famous potlucks in the past. Uh, as someone who uh, was born and raised here, I've been the beneficiary of all your guys' good cooking over the years, and all the niece, whom we all miss dearly. Uh, man, they've made the best food, right? Uh, but um, I know you guys are so humble, right, that you wouldn't say this yourself, that you guys are a good cook. But I know that you know that you know, okay? So... You don't, don't hide it. God bless you, you humble people. But if I were to try to come up with a list of these people, these good cooks, all you guys, uh, I would not put myself in that mix at all, right? Uh, thank you for laughing really loud at that one. <laughs> I am uh, like a look up a recipe online and barely managed to make it halfway decent status, right? Uh, I would put myself on the list of he probably, put in, probably shouldn't make anything too complicated for the potluck status, okay, or that list. But... Um, you know, one of the ways that I know this about myself is that sometimes when I'm cooking, I'm not dedicating my whole attention to it. It's really easy for me to get distracted. I'll start by, like, heating something up, and then I'll, I'll heat, heat it pan up. I'll go over, and I'll cook, uh, cut some vegetables, and then I'll totally forget about the pan. I'll get too hot, start smoking, so I have to go down and turn the pan down, but I didn't finish cutting the vegetables. And I'm like, oh, man, i got to start the meat, so i got to turn the heat back up on the pan, and I go to the pan, I start the meat, go back... Uh, 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 look at my phone, and I get distracted on my phone, and I'm like, oh man, now the meat's burning. I'm like, you can tell, it's just bad news, right? I'm not dedicating myself to the craft. Thank you, Remy. Um, but, you know, I'm just getting so distracted. So then I, you know, I suffer, and then Alexa suffers. So, you know, that's, I can't do that anymore. She, she has to, you know, have energy for her kid now, but that's bad. Uh, but as Christians sometimes, I just want to say that we allow ourselves to get distracted uh, from Jesus in a, in a similar way, right? There's distractions that come along, you know, you're trying to do this good thing, uh, but then something will come up, or we're doing something else, and then we'll look away from him, you know? And as time passes by with him, sometimes his presence, the feeling of his presence might fade. Or maybe we become so familiar with him that we take him for granted. Or perhaps we fill our lives with busy things and then we begin to prioritize Jesus less and less. Uh, it's too easy to drift away, right? And before we know it, we end up burning ourselves. Maybe you can relate to this because you've experienced it in the past. Maybe you can relate to this. Maybe you're going through it right now. Or maybe you have a loved one, like a friend or a relative family, someone who once actively loved and pursued Jesus, but now their faith is a memory. God's word for us today is not a call for us to, to judge ourselves or to hold our noses over other people. No, but it is a warning for every, every believer to not take for granted our faith and not backslide into a life and lifestyle without Jesus at the center of it. To check our hearts and then double check if he really is the one running our lives because he is the Lord of life, right? So we have to hold on to Jesus. We have to hold fast to him. But why, right? I mean, I think that's a, that's a good question that we should ask ourselves. Why should we hold fast to Jesus? 
Well, I mean, we're in church. You're going to say, like, of course, you know, Jesus is the answer to everything. But, but really, I mean, what are the, the solid answers, the firm ground that we could stand on with that? Why should we trust him? Why should we hope in him? I think it's such a big thing to try and trust somebody, not just Jesus, who's supposed to be God, right, but uh, any, anybody, right? Uh, over a period of years, um, there's a reason why you can trust your best friend with certain things, right? You, you've developed time, experience, trust, right? You've gotten to know who they are. Or maybe it's a spouse, same thing, you know? Uh, but, you know, how does that work with Jesus? Right? If, we, if we put it in a relational lens, right? How does that work? Why should we hold fast to him? So this question, it's very similar to the question last week that Pastor Eric was asking. Uh, but what the author of Hebrews is trying to do is expanding on this idea through the whole book, right? And that's where we're at in chapter 2, okay? So let's see how this question develops first in the first four verses. Why should we hold fast to Jesus? Uh, we should hold, hold fast to Jesus for he is greater than anyone. Hold fast to Jesus for he is greater than anyone. Jesus is inherently is an inherently unique being in the whole universe. And because of that, once we understand how truly great he is, it gives us more than enough reason for why we should hold fast to him instead of drifting from him. If you have your Bibles, I encourage you to bring them. Please open with me to Hebrews 2. Let's read it together. Don't take my word for it. Take God's word for it. Starting in verse 1 of chapter 2. Therefore, we must pay much closer attention to what we have heard, lest we drift away from it. For since the message uh, declared by angels proved to be reliable, and every transgression or disobedience received a just retribution, how shall we escape if we neglect such a great salvation? It was declared at first by the Lord, and it was attested to us by those who heard, while God also bore witness by signs and wonders and various miracles and by gifts of the Holy Spirit distributed according to his will. All right, so how many of us, if we're given important information, will we just ignore it, right? If we're given something very important, are you just going just gonna to let it go on by and get it going in one year and out the other, right? Uh, I think that's what the author of Hebrews is trying to do and trying to present here in this passage. Because Jesus is so great, because he's so good, we can't just let him pass us by. All of Hebrews in chapter 1 uh, was carefully curated so as to help the Hebrew listener and reader to begin seeing just how great Jesus is, right? In relation to the Old Testament, Jesus is the heir of all things we see here, the one through whom the world was created, the radiance of God's glory, an exact imprint of his nature. The list goes on, right? And all of these ideas are, are things that the Jewish Christian would be very familiar with, the original audience, right, the Jewish Christian. They would know because they already know the Old Testament, right? They know it so well. So knowing that Jesus is already so great, we have all the more reason to pay close attention to what has already been said about him. But what happens if we let Jesus drift away? The idea of a boat drifting comes to mind. That's what the author brings here. Jesus is all of those things we learn in chapter 1 and more. Right? He, he even upholds the universe by the power of his word and purifies sin, it says here. Uh, he sits at the right hand of God. He's greater than angels. I mean, you've got to be pretty cool if you're greater than angels. If Jesus is all of those things, then what will happen if we just let him go by? like a wandering boat, or better yet, a, a sushi plate on a conveyor belt. Maybe we can relate to that, right? You're like, ah, oh, I wanted that otoro, but then, ah, oh, you missed out. Someone else grabbed it. But the author of Hebrews answers it this way with a lesser to greater argument. All this means is that um, an ar- it's, this is an argument where if something lesser is true, then something greater, of course, will be true. For example, since the message, uh, the hope of the Old Testament in this, this, this case, was declared by angels as reliable, and, and angels we already know are below Jesus' status, and everyone who committed an act against God or disobeyed God in the past received just punishment back then, but then of course, how much worse would it be then for those who heard of Jesus and his words if he is so much better than those things? How could we escape if we ignore such a great salvation and immense hope? This idea, it's not meant to scare us. 
right? But help us consider just how great the gospel is. You know, I think there's something very sobering and real about the weightiness of it all. Uh, so we really got to take this seriously. You know, first Jesus declared the message, and those who heard it directly from Jesus told it to this audience here. Uh, and while at the same time God himself was a witness to it all, it says here through three things, like signs slash wonders, miracles, and gifts of the Holy Spirit, those three things. This wouldn't have been missed by the Jewish Christian, right? All of these things have their own weight to it. And then when you put them all together, it's like this great big weight of support. If, for example, uh, how many of you guys like Ben and Jerry's? I like Ben and Jerry's. Right? You can, oh, thank you for the, yeah, that was good. Uh, <laughs> but anyway, you guys know how Ben and Jerry's once a year gives away free ice cream, right? Uh, I think, one, oh, you didn't, uh, I'm sorry, but they do give away free ice cream once a year. At least they used to, but now you got to go find one of the stores. I think there's one in Oakland, right? right you could go there. But anyway, uh, I think one time in college, they had free ice cream day, and I got like 10 scoops of ice cream. I just kept going back in line, because Davis used to have one. It's closed now. But yeah, I, I didn't have a great stomach at the end of that day. But anyway, if you were offered free ice cream, right, would you not go out for that? Like, would you just ignore it? You know, maybe if you had something important to do that day, you, know, you would, I, was like, I, was like, I could just go buy free ice, ice cream another time, right? Or, or go next year, get free ice cream. But what if somebody were to offer you a free pair of shoes? Right? Well, it's, it's a little more valuable. Or what if you got a free computer, right? You got a, a new, the, like the, the latest, the newest PC gaming machine, or you got the latest and greatest iMac, you know, or they call it that anymore, I don't know. Um, but anyway... Would, it, would you be able to turn down those things? Or what if someone gave you a free car, right? You got the, the newest uh, sedan or, or minivan or SUV. What if you got a sports car? I don't know. Uh, maybe we don't like sports cars. But anyway, what if someone gave you a house, right? That'd be amazing. Please, someone give me a house. Okay. Anyway, um, anyway but would you, wouldn't you try to free up your schedule a little bit more that day if someone were to give you a free house and that was the only time you could get it. Of course we would. But how much greater then is salvation? A life with Jesus here and now and forever in the future. How much greater is that than any of those other things? Those material things. It's one thing to agree that the message of Jesus is great and at the same time, we acknowledge, like from our own life experiences, that it's much more difficult to live that out in practice in our day-to-day -day lives. So do we truly believe that Jesus is great if we're a Christian? Then yes, sure, Jesus is great. But why do we still struggle to live that out in our day-to-day -day lives, our everyday decisions? I would argue it's not a belief issue. It's not a problem with our minds, but a problem with our hearts. I could try to give the best apologetic argument as to why Jesus is great, and I think Pastor Eric already did a great job of that last week. So approaching this in a different way, why do we still struggle to love and look like Jesus and who he is and what he has done? His character and his actions, even though we already know that he is good. He's so good. We fight to hold fast to Jesus not by, by not solely learning more about him, right? not just by filling our minds with who he is, but by growing our desire, our desire in our hearts for him, more than the things that we think are better. It's not just we, a mental ascension. We have to have our minds and our hearts working together to be constantly refreshed and renewed, to have a great, to greater desire to love Jesus better and better because he truly is better. Our hearts, they are naturally misled, right? It's easy to wander. Um, I know my heart is naturally misled, misled. It's easy to wander. Misled by selfish things, selfish desires, earthly things. Therefore, we must pursue what is unnatural to our original sinful nature in order to supernaturally overcome our weakness by the grace and power of Jesus. To counteract our natural inclinations, or I'm going to make up a word here, sin inclinations, haha, <laughs> Right, uh, I don't know, maybe that, 
I won't use that next time. But anyway, uh, we must immerse ourselves daily in the goodness of God. This is because we are being pulled daily in directions away from him. So ask yourself right now in your own minds, don't say it out loud, but just ask your own self right now, what would be the most effective way for you specifically, unique to you, to specifically immerse yourself in God's word or God in God and who he is daily? Right? Would, uh, what would move you to daily see how great he is instead of daily drifting away from him, being attracted to lesser things? Is it singing songs? Is it using uh, daily devotions or Bible apps? Is it Christian audiobooks or simple prayers and meditations? Or is it a combination of those things? Is it taking five minutes out of your day to just drop whatever you are doing, look up to the sky, and give thanks to God? You know, it doesn't have to be something uh, intense, you know? You don't have to become a hermit and escape to the woods and then build a hut for yourself and become man versus wild. Okay, you don't have to do that. But how can you immerse yourself in God and his goodness daily? Again, the power to change, it is a supernatural work. I just want to emphasize that again, meaning we cannot do that work ourselves to change our hearts. However, we can discipline ourselves to intentionally look at and desire Jesus' good message. And the hope then over time is that he will transform us to love him more and become like him more. It is in those disciplined moments with God that our hearts are recentered around the greatness of our God and the goodness of the gospel. And this is what it means to be a gospel-centered person like we talk about in our church and understanding our wayward hearts, yet at the same time allowing God to change us and transform us. I hope this helps us to hold fast to Jesus, for he is greater than anyone. But why else should we hold fast to Jesus? Secondly, for he is the only faithful God. There's no other God other than him, and he is the only faithful one to us. So much so to the point that he willingly became like us and suffered for us. But we'll explain that in a uh, get into that in a second. Let's read verses 5 to 13. For it was not to angels that God subjected the world to come, of which we are speaking. It has been testified somewhere, what is man that you are mindful of him, or the son of man that you care for him? You made him for a little while lower than the angels. You have crowned him with glory and honor, putting everything in subjection under his feet. Now in putting everything in subjection to him, he left nothing outside his control. At present we do not yet see everything in subjection to him, but we see him for a little while was made lower than the angels, namely Jesus, crowned with glory and honor because of the suffering of death, so that by the grace of God he might taste death for everyone. For it was fitting that he, for whom and by whom all things exist, in bringing many sons to glory, should make the founder of their salvation perfect through suffering. For he who sanctifies and those who are sanctified all have one source. That is why he is not ashamed to call them brothers, saying, I will tell of your name to my brothers in the midst of the congregation. I will sing your praise. And again, I will put my trust in him. And again, behold, I and the children of God has given me. So talking about the things that angels declared earlier in verse 2 here in verses 5 to 13, we begin to see the author beginning to go back to those previously declared words and using them to further support Jesus' greatness. And in verses 6 to 8, we see a reference from Psalm 8, right? If you, if you, so in, in our Bibles, uh, we have those little reference letters, uh, and you could go back and see where it comes from. But this one's from Psalm 8. This psalm gives praise to God while also outlining humanity's position as beloved, specifically overseers and caretakers of the earth. How appropriate, then, that Jesus, also known as the Son of Man, is also identified alongside God's beloved people. Those, these, these verses, they come from the Old Testament. It just goes to show that the Bible is just one big story connected to itself. The Old is no longer irrelevant, but it's the Old Testament from where we get to begin to see the, the beginnings of who Jesus is. And in the New Testament, then, we get to see that completed. And sometimes we, we have this idea, yeah, 
Looking down to verses 8 to 11, again, Jesus' status above the angels is outlined. And not just is he greater than them, but he is beloved by God. He is so beloved that God is mindful of him and he cares for him. And though Jesus' status was, it says here below, uh, angels for a little while, uh, it was only briefly during the time of his humanity, is what this is talking about here. The time that he walked the earth like you and me. How humbling then that Jesus, the God of the universe, uh, would suffer death for us by his grace. You know, I, th- I think it's interesting then that how the, through, the, through the one who created everything and everyone, you and me, that God would allow himself, the founder of salvation, to suffer. I think that's a, that's a little crazy to me. I would think that if God really is who he says he is and he can overcome any problem in the universe, like death, like sin, just by a snap of his finger, so just by saying some words, right? If God really is all-powerful, then why not just do that so Jesus didn't have to go through that? But instead of that, we see him choose suffering. What does that say then about this salvation that we get? I think that, only, that means that there, could, that there is something about God's nature, there's something about who he is and the nature of the universe that in order to not go against who he is, his perfect goodness, his perfect justice, his mercy, love, and grace, suffering death was necessary to grant salvation. Death deserves payment, and Jesus paid it all. Right? So... God really did have to do that in that way. Now, looking at verse 11, Jesus paid it all. He sanctified us all. He allows us to be identified as family together with him. You and I, we get to be brothers and sisters with Jesus, thus granting further assurance of Jesus' greatness. We are identified together with him, but also his faithfulness for us in that he did not run away from his mission on the cross but he faithfully stayed on course. Again, it's his faithfulness here that proves he is, truly is the only faithful God. In verses 12 to 13, again, we see the author drawing further uh, messianic references and support from the Old Testament for Jesus. Uh, we, you see it says here, I will tell of your name to my brothers uh, in the midst of the congregation. I will sing your praise. And by identifying the speaker of this verse from Psalm 22 as Jesus, the author is saying that Jesus will speak of God, uh, uh, that Jesus will speak of God uh, to his born-again family, uh, and that he will sing the Lord's praise. Or he speak to God of his born-again family, sorry, uh, and sing the Lord's praise. Every first century Jewish Christian, they would know that this is Jesus speaking here. And what the early church in Hebrews would it undoubtedly notice as well, that this verse, if we go back and look at the psalm, that this is the same psalm where we hear the words, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Right, those words Jesus cried out before the crucifixion. So the tie and the connection between Psalm 22 to Jesus is clearly messianic. And the early church knew it, now we know it. And though Jesus cried out those words as he agonized over the crucifixion, after it was all over, he could cry out, Here, I will tell of your name to my brothers. In the midst of the congregation, I will sing your praise. Look at the next two quotes, both from Isaiah 8, another messianic-related passage from the Old Testament. I will put my trust in him. It comes from uh, 8.17b. But how does that relate to Jesus? Uh, as Isaiah had, a, had to trust in God while his message received no response, Jesus had to depend on God as he shared in our humanity. While persecuted as a human, Jesus relied on and kept his faith in God. Just as the church of Hebrews suffered in their time, so did he. They were weak, he was too. They needed to rely on God just as Jesus did. This last quote uh, from Isaiah 8, 18, again, emphasizes Jesus' solidarity with humanity. Another and again, right? It's like support verse ver- to support verse to, again, a third support verse, right? That's how, what the author is trying to do. Christ identifies himself together with the children God has given him. 
Originally, Isaiah said uh, these words referring to his own two sons, but when applied to Jesus, it is a message of comfort, of solace, of his faithfulness. Jesus is his children's family, and his children's family is Jesus. Altogether, these three quotes provide huge messianic comfort and hope as they got to see how Jesus was faithful to his mission for us and identified himself with us, his people. I know that's a mouthful, but I hope you get to see that. So just as Jesus was faithful to the early church, he is faithful to you and me in our sufferings and our persecutions. From an unbelieving world, Jesus knows what it is like and can say fully, I know my child. He's experienced the full breadth of the human experience. He knows what it's like to be tempted. He knows what it's like to be tired. He knows what it's like to be worn down. When your coworker slights you, or when your old acquaintance talks down on you, or when your family relationships are exasperated because of your faith, Jesus knows what it is like and is faithfully with us. We know how faithful Jesus is to us, but in application, how can we be faithful to Jesus? Of course, we talked earlier earlier about uh, fighting for our desire, right, from our hearts to be for Jesus, to be first and foremost in our lives. Uh, And sure, we must try to aim to love and be like Jesus, but we also have to realize that we are not Jesus. We are not Jesus. Maybe you're familiar uh, with uh, the concept or the experience of Christian guilt, right? Uh, It's having an excess of uh, feeling, uh, feelings of guilt or shame for our sin or or shortcomings, right? If you've grown up in any type of church setting or have been walking with Jesus for any amount of time, uh, maybe this has crept into your faith at one point in time, uh, maybe it affects how you think about God, or maybe, yeah, you know, you've dealt with it, maybe. But simplifying this idea, it could be as, as, as simple as, or elementary as, I love God, but I still sin. Therefore, I am bad. Now, because I am bad, I should make myself feel worse than I really should. Like flogging yourself, whipping yourself, right? Hitting yourself on the head with a plank. But no right church we should not be doing that we shouldn't be walking around beating ourselves up jesus has already forgiven us he's already forgiven you he's already forgiven me it's a work that is already done in the past tense we might feel like a walking contradiction at times as a sinful christian when we fail to measure up to jesus but jesus did not free and comfort us in order that we walk in deeper shame and guilt no we should be walking in greater freedom because he has freed us from those things i'm not sure about you i still struggle with us with this right uh it's uh, such a gargantuan task to perfectly love jesus and one of the hardest things for me to do in this fight to love him is to surrender to the idea that no matter how much i try i will always fail to live up to his name and his reputation but despite that he has not saved us and freed us from our guilt and shame to for us to continue walking in those feelings in that experience but he's given us the greatest grace and comfort that is only possible by him in his greatest work. So you see how the starting point is different from which we live our lives, right? We're not starting from shame and guilt, but we're starting from love and grace. It's completely different. So for as much as we can methodically strive for Jesus, we must realize the mode or the, how we strive for Jesus must include the idea that we can never be fully like him, at least not on this side of heaven. We have to accept that. I'm anxious and I, and I feel guilt for my, for my sin, sure, but I must learn to accept that Jesus does not demand perfection. Instead, he demands our attempted faithfulness. Right? Jesus lived the perfect and sinless life. He lived the most faithful life so that we, you know, in, in our shortcomings, we don't have to. And I hope that when, when you hear this... Um, you don't, you don't hear, uh, oh, this is a license to sin. I'm going to go and party it up and, you know, live my life how I want to. No. 
Um, it's not a license to sin. Instead, it is an ask to try our best in loving him each and every day. That no matter how we feel, we will try our best to love him each and every day. Not just on Sunday morning, right? Not just at Bible study. Not just when you see your, your Christian friend or your friends from church. No. Every hour of every day. So that even when we fail or we have a, a, a bad day or we fail in a great big way, we would know that Jesus still wants us to get back up, to strive for him, to love him, always moving towards him. I think if we shift our thinking and goals away from sinless perfection and guilt-driven living towards living in the hope of Jesus, by what's already he's proven that he's done, that we would hopefully learn to live more freely in the grace of his love. That has already been accomplished already because he was the perfectly faithful one. Again, the motive to love Jesus then begins with his love for us instead of our unnecessary guilt and shame. So, again, we should hold fast to Jesus Right? For that uh, he is uh, greater than anyone, uh, and we should also hold fast to him, for he is the only faithful God. And last but not least, we should hold fast to him, for he grants the best hope. Jesus grants the best hope. Let's start in verse 14 and read together. Since therefore the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise partook of the same things, that through death he might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is the devil, and deliver all those who through fear of death were subject to lifelong slavery for surely it is not angels that he helps but he helps the offspring of abraham therefore he had to be made like his brothers in every respect so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of god and make propitiation for the sins of the people for because he himself has suffered when tempted he is able to help those who are being tempted so what this passage is trying to say is that because Jesus shares, excuse me, uh, the same flesh and blood as you and me, uh, he also experienced the same things as you and me. Because he knows what it's like to be human, he also knows what it's like to be tempted. In the face of his suffering, in the face of his temptations, Jesus, unlike us though, he was able to stand up against those things. And by dying for us because of his sinless perfection already proven by his faithfulness, he was able to conquer death, able to, to beat Satan once and for all in order to deliver us who were once slaves to sin. Again, angels aren't like Jesus in the ways he can work like this. Only Jesus can do this to save us. Right? He is the unique, almighty, great one. Right? He's greater than everyone. And just as the uh, Jewish Christian or the Hebrew believer would understand, we need a faithful high priest, it says here, to stand with us and stand for us to atone and cleanse us. That's just how you can understand this idea of propitiation, that you can atone and stand uh, and cleanse us. This is part of what makes Jesus so special, right? Uh, that he himself suffered, was tempted like we are, experiencing, again, the fullness of humanity. And even after it all, he helps both you and me in our temptations of weakness. He conquered it already, and then he helps us conquer it too. Right? He joins hands with us. He, he helps us. He walks alongside us. I think this is part of the beauty of the gospel. Um, it's, it's, it's shown here through Hebrews. I think... Um, Hebrews is a great book, uh, and one reason for partly uh, because uh, it helps us tie together the whole Bible together, right, from the old to the new, to see how the gospel really comes together, right, and at the fruition or the, the climax of it all is Jesus. So, you know, nothing can stand in our way, friends, brothers and sisters. Death, sin, Satan himself, they can't because Jesus already conquered all of those things. Sometimes we can be tricked by this misconception that there's some, um, well, there is a battle of good and evil, but it's not an equal one, right? It's a, it's a cosmic one-sided battle where Jesus has already won the war for our salvation. 
By living like you, like you and me, fully human yet mysteriously fully, God, Jesus, is able to identify and comfort us in ways that no other one could, no other religion or worldly hope ever could. And by living a sinless life, he became our perfect sacrifice. Right, going back to that nature of God. There's something about who he is that he had to suffer for us. That's to not go into contradiction against himself. By dying on the cross, he saved us from dying on ours. By rising from the grave, he conquered death and Satan for us. Even after all this, Jesus could say, hey, look at me. You have to follow me now. I'm going to make you do it. He deserves it. But instead, he invites us and he says, hey, you're with me. Let's go uh, take uh, a walk together now. Go talk to the Father now. He identifies us with him and in the most basic essence of who we are because that is what he's able to do for us. Maybe uh, you guys have, are familiar with um, C.S. Lewis's uh, The Chronicles of Narnia, right? Uh, I don't know how the movies are. I only watched the first one. Uh, but the books are good, right? Um, and um, anyway, there's this character uh, in the Chronicles of Narnia named Aslan. He's the Jesus figure of the series uh, where he, Aslan, he finally brings the kids whom he's been friends with this whole time in the story to his real country for the first time, the eternal Narnia. The kids, on the other hand, they, they're afraid that he's going to send them back to England uh, where their home is, but with Aslan, but then Aslan assures them that he's not going to do that. Instead, he says this, uh, and this is from the last book on the last page of that series. Uh, there was a real railway accident, Aslan said Aslan softly. Your father and mother and all of you are as you used to call it in the Shadowlands, dead. The term is over, the holidays have begun, the dream is ended, this is the morning. And as he spoke, he no longer looked to them like a lion, but the things that began to happen after that were so great and beautiful that I cannot write them. And for us, this is the end of all the stories, and we can mostly truly say that they all lived happily ever after. But for them, it was only the beginning of the real story. All their life in this world and all their adventures in Narnia had only been the cover and the title page. Now at last, they were beginning chapter one of the great story, which no one on earth has read, which goes on forever, in which every chapter is better than the one before. When we come uh, to pass from our earthly lives in the future, we can take hope in the fact that the end is no longer the end for us. Because Jesus conquered sin and death once and for all, it is the only beginning, it is only the beginning of an eternity with him that will only get better and better as each cosmic day passes from the, to the next. And this is why we should hold fast to Jesus, that, that though there are so many uh, good things uh, that we can't even comprehend or begin to imagine. It's right there on the other side of faithfulness to Christ that he is so great and he's so good. He's better than everything in this world. Then hopefully you and I can say with full confidence and assurance that we should hold fast to Jesus for he is the ultimate savior and the best hope. I hope that for both you and for me, we would no longer drift and slowly fade away from Jesus uh, like we've seen from time to time in our own lives or from, you know, those that we know, our, our loved, beloved friends and family. But if we do drift, we can forever know that we can always uh, turn back to Jesus. We can always fix our anchors to him for Jesus. Again, he is the ultimate savior and the best hope. He will never turn us away. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, good morning, and thank you, Lord, for your great love for us. Thank you that you have saved us once and for all. You've given us the greatest hope. You are the ultimate Savior. You are greater than anyone. 
Lord, you are the only faithful God. Help us, Lord, in our weakness, in our struggling to hold to you. Regardless of how long we have known you, we know we fall short. Regardless of how close we are with you, we know our shortcomings with you. Help us, Lord, to give those feelings of guilt and shame over to you. Lord, that we would feel the full and know the full experience of your comfort in, by your grace and your love right now, that we would be freed, Lord, to love you unashamed, unabashedly. To know, Lord, that you are saving us, Lord, and you have saved us. Thank you for my brothers and sisters now. Lord, help us, Lord, please, to give everything to you. Because you have resurrected, you can resurrect us. Thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.